A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say, they were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. From the cloud came a voice, this is my beloved son. Suddenly looking, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the sisters who was speaking at a conference I, I attended describes meeting a very special young man, Nick, from Wisconsin. Nick had a special physical condition which left him totally speechless except for making a few groans and was confined completely to a wheelchair. So one day the youth minister at their parish felt inspired to ask Nick if he would play Jesus at the live stations of the cross. And so that Good Friday, there was a hush over the entire parish as Nick's father, Gary, carried him from station to station. And the crucifixion scene in particular left people speechless because as Nick hung there on the cross, his father's face was hidden from sight, but he was actually standing behind Nick with his arms wrapped around him, holding up his son. The image was unmistakable. The message was clear. In the live stations, as Jesus, played by Nick, made his way through each station, the Father had not abandoned the Son. And at the very darkest, most painful moment, at the crucifixion, when the Father seemed absent, he was actually so close as to be behind him, wrapping his arms around his son to hold him up. The reminder that God is present even in the darkest hours of our lives is the message of the transfiguration. The transfiguration, the event when Jesus' clothes became dazzling white and was seen conversing with Elijah and Moses, takes place right after Jesus told his disciples that his darkest, most painful moment of his life was about to take place, that he would be crucified and killed, and on the third day rise again. The disciples didn't know how to handle such news, so on the journey towards Jerusalem, the very place where all this would happen, Jesus takes aside Peter, James, and John to witness the incredible event to give them hope for the future. Now, when the gospel says that they went up this high mountain, the writer wasn't kidding. I've been to the Holy Land twice now, and I went up Mount Tabor where the transfiguration to took place. Okay, well, in full disclosure, when I say I went up the mountain, it was more like I opted for the 15-minute bus ride. But at the top, right, one almost gets an aerial view of the Jezreel Valley, also known as Megiddo, also known as Armageddon. You see, Jesus doesn't do, doesn't do things randomly. So in the place where he was transfigured and seen in the fullness of his glory, the disciples and him were overlooking the valley of Armageddon. It was almost as if he was saying, 
that as they were looking to the end of the world, there is still hope. That even there, God did not abandon his son, and neither would he abandon us in our struggles and most painful moments. I know with the current state of our world and our country right now, I've certainly been not looking at the news much recently, but it may seem that we are facing the end of the world. Many young people feel isolated with some schools closed to in-person instruction, the cancellation of prom, many social events, not seeing family and friends for a long time, and I hear of families that are having marital strife, loss of jobs, death in their families, and people who have come to rely on going to church may now find themselves a bit lost, as in some places they can't even do what we're doing right now and sitting in these pews. So it certainly is dark, and in this penitential season of Lent, people may even wonder, why choose to take on the practices of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving if my life is already full of sacrifices? Well, look to the transfiguration. After hearing about the sad events going to take place, the disciples' look was downcast. They were very much focused on things below. And in order to have hope, they needed elevated vision. They needed to get above the dark times, the prospects of failure, above those worldly expectations to be accepted for glory, ex power, and to be reminded of the Father's presence with them, who points us towards his Son and the need to look to him always. Therefore, prayer, fasting, almsgiving serve the purpose of giving us this elevated vision by stripping us from complete reliance on human beings and focusing on communicating and relying on God first through prayer. Fasting deprives us of indulging in our baser passions. It could be eating, social media, there's definitely a lot of base passions there. Entertainment, to realize that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Almsgiving, not always to look to provide for ourselves selfishly, but to give generously to provide for those in need. By doing this, we spiritually climb Mount Tabor to better hear the voice of God and see his glory for the needed graces to endure the cross ahead. In fact, this looking to God alone, this stripping of relying on everything besides him, and the need to have faith is echoed in the story of Abraham and Isaac in the first reading as well. Because if we only saw this story as disturbing and troubling of why God would ask Abraham to carry out this, such a task, then we would miss the point completely. Because God never wanted Abraham to kill his son, which is why he sent his angel to stop him. But what God did want was for Abraham to prefer nothing to the love of him. God wanted Abraham to have faith such that he made God not number two, not number three, but the first in his life. And once that proper order was established, Abraham, in fact, had everything he could ever want, including his most beloved son, Isaac. Every once in a while, I read from a blog called A Living Sacrifice from Father Dana Ambrose Christensen. And on a pilgrimage to Fatima, the sacristan at the Basilica noticed how pious Father was and said, I have been watching you all week, and I've never seen a priest as devoted as you. You came here alone, but now you do not leave here alone. Our Lady goes with you. Father Dana agreed. So on the last night, as he was praying in front of the, the shrine, he said, Our Lady, make me a saint no matter what, no matter what the cost. And in his own words, he said, I thought that prayer would be answered by making him strong and powerful, by making him a bishop of a large diocese. Maybe God would make him a preacher on the large stage. And maybe, just maybe, he would even make him a cardinal or even a pope. He said his thoughts were filled with so much of that sort of pride. But upon arrival back in Minnesota, Father received a call from his doctor diagnosing him with ALS. 
which has since then removed his ability to move, celebrate mass, and even speak. He writes his blogs through a computer program that types words through the movement of his eyes. He said, yes, my prayer was answered, but not in the way I expected. But you know what? This disease has stripped me from being a glutton when I overate, from using my mouth for gossip and foul language, from running to the places where I knew I shouldn't have gone, and from running from the places where I knew I should have been, because I can't move. This is making me a saint by stripping me of everything besides God, but it has not stripped my ability to pray and communicate with the one who understands me and loves me perfectly. Might it be that this Lent, God is calling you and me to spiritually climb Mount Tabor, or at least to take a bus, to climb and gain an elevated vision apart from Jesus, uh, apart with Jesus, so as to hear more clearly the voice of the Father, so that when we are then called to come back down and make this journey on our own crosses and to face the darkness that is ahead, we may not despair, but have our hearts transfigured with the knowledge that like Nick's father, our Heavenly Father has not abandoned us in our darkest moments, but instead holds us up so that we can continue following on the path of his Son, Jesus Christ.